It's hard to look at what has come of the province I grew up in, particularly our largest city, Vancouver. Everyone living here knows a victim of our addiction and homelessness crisis, but the problem has grown at an exponential rate as the cost of living and inflation post-lockdown has become unbearable for the average Canadian. The rent is atrocious out here, just atrocious. What's the average cost to rent an apartment here in Vancouver? A one bedroom is about 2000 And who can afford that? A room is $800, and we're talking bugs and rats and lice and everything else, and they want 800 So uh, it, it's to the point of absurdity. There are thousands, at least 10, 15,000 waiting to get in low income. And the chances, some are eight, 10 years with their name on the list, it's, it's ridiculous. They haven't been building any low income, no nothing. So, uh, you know, people aren't making it. They're throwing a tent up, they're being uh, evicted. <laughs> Because I'm paying $600 for a walk-in closet right now, right? And that's just a walk-in closet. You're paying $600 for a closet? Yes, for a walk-in closet. That's no bigger than this four spaces right here that I'm paying $600 for. Yeah. One reason I wanted to investigate the crisis of homelessness is because I fear many have the flawed belief that it is simply impossible to tackle. Little known fact is that homelessness was not a social issue in Canada until the 1980s. Somehow we were able to provide more housing half a century ago than we are today, despite Canadians paying significantly less in taxes at the time. It is undeniable that Canada's mass immigration experiment has not kept up with infrastructure, especially with strict zoning and building regulations. Canada only builds around 200,000 homes a year, yet have set targets for accepting nearly half a million migrants annually, leading to a cutthroat battle for the little housing available, causing prices to soar, on top of the already vicious effects of inflation. While many peg the homeless crisis as simply an addiction problem, Recent polling found addiction was only the second leading cause of homelessness in BC, while lack of income came first, with 14% saying COVID-19 and its impacts, the policies and lockdown around it were directly linked to their loss of housing. Further polling has shown nearly half of Vancouverites fear they will be unable to pay their rent or mortgage in the coming year. So what has the government done about this? They've spent nearly $30 billion each year to fund new social services aimed at helping the country's homeless population. Great, right? Not exactly, because seemingly they have absolutely no idea what services they are providing, where, and if they are effective or not. A reality not just reflected by critical reports, but also those I spoke to on the ground. Oh, I don't know what to do. What do you mean? We told you 10 years ago this was coming. So don't give me this BS. I've gone to meetings 15 years ago. How are we gonna do it? We gave them the solution. Open up Riverview, open up centers where they can go crash, open up uh, clinics, uh, everything. Well, well, we'll look into it. You're too busy giving subsidies to law laws. <laughs> no, no, we're gonna have another meeting and we're gonna have another meeting and we're gonna ask the same questions give us the same answers and I'm making $50 an hour. Thank you, you can go home, let's have another meeting. And I'm making 50 an hour, you're not making nothing. Now let's have another meeting, five cents.
out of every dollar given down here goes to the poor. 95% is, let's have another meeting. I'm making $50 an hour. Come on. This BS has got to stop. So what do you think is is being done? Could you explain it a bit more in detail? There's nothing being done. There's nothing being done. Can't really explain anything other than there's nothing being done. They like to talk, but they don't do anything. Alina Turner, who has a PhD researching issues of homelessness and public services, has stated even she has trouble understanding how all of these services function as there is no official list or catalog of where all the government spending is being allocated. We need to clean our own house before we say, hey, let's add more to it, because we don't even have a solid sense of who all these services are, Turner says. In fact, when we were on the ground in Vancouver, the only people we found actively helping out the homeless population were churches and local volunteers, not a single government organization could be found actively on the streets. Given their absence, the on-the-ground reports were likely true, with most government workers getting billions in funding to stop homelessness, spending the majority of their time in heat-controlled offices, having their 7,000th meeting about how meetings should be conducted, then returning home with their six-figure paycheck. This phenomenon is referred to as the homeless industrial complex. The ecosystem of bureaucrats, NGOs, and corporations that claim to aid the marginalized, but actually do little beyond profiting off the perpetuation of homelessness, poverty, and addiction. This complex is alive and well in places like Vancouver. For example, between 2017 and 2018, the BC Housing Board's budget grew from $782 million to $1.9 billion under an NDP government. Yet housing conditions worsened over that period. How, you may ask? Well, the resignation of the BC Housing Board CEO this last September may hold some answers. Shane Ramsey was CEO of BC Housing for over 20 years and was recently caught in what appears to be a corruption scandal after awarding low-income SRO housing contracts to the property management company Atira Women's Resources Society. Atira fleeced BC taxpayers by paying $6 million above BC assessment values this year for a 79-unit single-room occupancy hotel and has been the center of controversy as tenants of properties managed by Atira have stated their upkeep, maintenance, and cleaning are just abysmal. Buildings filled with rats, insects, and barely functioning utilities. How did such an incompetent company get these contracts, though? Well, the Atira Women's Resources Society is an organization run by Shane Ramsey's wife, Janice Abbott. Also of interest may be the fact that Vancouver's last mayor, Kennedy Stewart, who championed heavy investment into these SROs, was also married to an Atira board member, Jeanette Ash. So the government are pushing more people into the lower class with inflation, lockdowns that destroy businesses, and higher taxes, while also profiting off the very problem they are causing and perpetuating, meanwhile selling their business as heroism. I think it can be scary for us to conceptualize the homeless population in our society as people just like us, because we don't want to think we could ever be in their position. But the truth is, I spoke to individuals who were previously business owners, athletes, moms and dads now living on the streets, people who were just like you and me, and not just living on our streets, but dying on our streets. Time is just like, you know, like the deaths keep piling up and people don't seem to give a, or people don't seem to care, so. How many people have died here just this year so far, would you say? I couldn't even, I couldn't even tell you, like, the amount. <laughs> I mean, like. Could you give people an idea of, of what that culture is like? Personally, like, people that, like, I know in the time that I've lived down here, like, upwards of 40 or 50 people that I know, like, personally, that have, that have passed, and that's just, like, that's like minimal compared to like people who have been down here longer or are actually like part of this 
street population or like the houseless population. 40 or 50 people you've known have died since you've lived here on this street. Because they haven't built any low income or any other buildings. They're hoarding the money. We need shelters. People are out on the street freezing to death in this city. They had all summer to start opening up shelters. Now, oh, uh, we don't know what to do. What do you mean you don't know? You've had months to start opening up shelters. People are dying on the street here. So it's, it's, they don't want to spend the money. That's the bottom line. It seems like most of the people I'm running into that are helping the community here on the streets are non-government. They're just community members. Yes, uh, I was talking to them and there's church members and people that want to give. Tossing aside these lives being lost as simply addicts who cannot be helped allows our governments to get away with no questioning of their poor policies and theft. To quote the National Post, in 1971, economist William Arthur Niskanen theorized that bureaucrats being self-interested like everyone else tend to maximize their own budgets rather than provide maximally effective services. Larger budgets mean great job security and potential salary growth. A large body of academic literature has since explored this problem. Bureaucracies that administer programs for the homeless seem particularly vulnerable to this phenomenon because the effectiveness of these problems are difficult to measure and because criticism of such programs invites indignant pushback. From the left, you'll hear, how dare you criticize the programs helping the poor, you fascist? And from the right, you'll hear, well, of course these programs aren't working. These people can't be helped. They're addicts. And from the bureaucrats and NGOs, you'll just see a smiling, knowing nod that they'll keep getting away with it indefinitely. Well-connected spouses receive contracts. Networks of ineffective NGOs receive large grants while delivering programs of dubious effectiveness, but their inability to deliver results doesn't matter because these NGOs and the activists they employ can be relied upon to lobby in defense of the homeless industrial complex, guaranteeing more cash to burn. This critique can also be applied to addiction services that refuse to nudge people towards rehab and instead enable addicts through over-permissive harm reduction. By fostering dependency, these NGOs guarantee and grow demand for their services. We live in a world where it pays to have problems, where the people making the most profit are too often people profiting off pretending to make none. And these governments and corrupt NGOs have increasingly more cover for their incompetent money-making programs as the general populace are too busy bickering amongst themselves and blaming other victims of this great swindling for the crises at hand.